The CBS Radio Mr. Presents. What is your pleasure this time? Let me fill your cup. Two icy fingers of terror, add equal parts of mystery and suspense, and top with a dash of the unknown. Settle back and sip. We shall consider the wisdom of the ancient Tibetan sage, Aho Chan. One day a disciple asked, Master, is the book of each man's life written by himself or by the immortal God. And the Holy One replied, By both. The gods write only two pages, the first and the last. Man writes all the others himself. And if the Master has spoken truly, perhaps each of us might stop to consider what he has written now and then. Our story this time deals with the page before the last in the book of a young lady's life. One moment, Sergeant. Yes, what is it? I intend to kill you. What? Put down that pistol. Well, certainly. After I fired it. You can't kill a police officer in broad daylight and hope to get away with it. What? I'm sure I can. Just a minute. Now, it won't do you any good to rush me. I can squeeze this trigger faster than you can move. Stop! drama, The Weavers of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. Here is Eleanor Brody walking down the street on a quiet, sunny Saturday morning, on her way to Frank's Market to buy a packet of special British breakfast tea. Golden-haired, green-eyed, willowy Eleanor. You'd never take her for 32. She looks at least 10 years younger. But that doesn't matter anymore. She'll never see 33. Tall, attractive Eleanor Brody is about to become a statistic. And as Eleanor enters Frank's market, Frank himself is at the register. Bald and chubby, good-natured Frank. And he's about to become a statistic, too. And, waiting to pay for her purchases, elderly Mrs. Alda Sassuiev, soon she will also be a statistic. Look through the window. A car has just pulled up. A thin, very pale young man steps out. His right hand is in his jacket pocket. He is headed for the store. For lack of a better name, let us call him a maker of statistics. Where is it all going to end, so drunk? I was talking to the minister just last night. He said he'll have to learn how to live on air. For the second thing I saw the some chocolate for my little granddaughter. I got it. Wait, hold it. Hold it now. Don't move. Oh. It's a cigarette. Oh. Oh. Shut up. 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 No, we got nothing on it. It was a stick-up, Ben. It's a new breed of punk. The old-time guys, they'd at least let you live. These crumbs. You don't give them the money, they kill you. You do give them the money, they kill you. I know you got to print something, but well, you can't squeeze blood out of a stone. When I get something, I'll give you something. <coughs> well, look who's here. Hello, Captain Gordon. Bobby Clifton. What are you doing in this place? <laughs> it's only for detectives. You want to see my badge? How are things in the youth section? Artie, I want you to give me a temporary transfer back to Homicide. Why? The grocery store killings this morning. Yeah. What would you want with that? 
I knew the girl. I knew Eleanor Brody. Yeah? We went to school together. It was ten years ago. We were, well, sort of engaged. What does that mean, sort of? It didn't work out. Oh, why? Why? I wanted to be a cop and she couldn't see it. I've been married 25 years and my wife still can't. Anyway, we decided to break up. You mean she did? Mm Mm-hmm. And I never saw her again. But it was yesterday, Friday. I got a phone call. She called me just like that. Just like that? It was as if we'd seen each other the day before. She said, Bobby, I must talk to you. Come over to my place tomorrow morning and we'll have breakfast. That would have been this morning. Yeah. So? My life. I got mad. It was the way she said it, I guess, as if nothing had happened. Like, drop whatever you're doing and come running just because I snapped my fingers. Oh, that's how they are, Bobby. So I said I happened to be tied up, and she said... She said, never mind. Forget it. I'm sorry, Bobby. It took me nearly all this time to get over it. And I wasn't going to start... And I just... I never really got over it. Anyhow, this morning I set out for her apartment... There on the corner, I saw the squad cars. Artie, I want to work on this case. Eh, what's to work on, Bobby? Some nervous punk gets trigger happy. Where do you find it? You don't. That one day, some hood who faces a rap makes a deal for himself by blowing the whistle on a pal. I want to work on the case, Artie. I know, I know. You figured if you'd gone there when she asked you, she'd be alive now. And so it's a whole guilty thing. I should have gone to see her when she called me. Bobby, it's not going to happen. I keep thinking about that phone call. She she sounded scared. You're building it up in your head. She was scared of something. She said, I must talk to you. Not I want to or I'd like to, but I must. Now, why did she say must? Because she figures she overlooked a good bet ten years ago. Artie, I failed her. You have got to let me work on the case. Work on what? There's nothing to go on. No witnesses, nothing. Why do you insist that it was an ordinary pickup? What else could it be? Suppose it was something else. Like what? Hardly let me work on it. All right, but don't get in anybody's way. The old lady, Mrs. Olga Stasio. I understand she's still alive. All right. I'll go to the hospital and see her. Nobody can see her. She's in intensive care. I'll see her. I know, Sergeant, this is important for the police, but the patient can't see anyone. Doctor, she doesn't have to see me. I just want to see her. You mean you just want to look at her? Why? The nurse says she keeps muttering something. Now, perhaps I can catch a word or two. Oh, all right. As long as she isn't disturbed funny how things are interrelated, Sergeant. What's that, Doctor? These two women, the young one who died, and Mrs. Stossi, who may not live out today, and the younger one, Miss Brody, her name was, she was here about a week ago. What for? Well, it was midnight. She couldn't reach her own doctor, so she came to emergency. Why? But it seems she had a very severe, serious skin irritation all over her arms and back. What caused it? I don't know. She didn't want to save the pet, so we gave her something for superficial relief. She probably consulted her own physician the next day. Here she is, in the hospital again, this time in the morgue. Oh, you want to see Mrs. Stockwell. Oh, please, doesn't sound like anything at all to me. Her name is Stasiuk. Olga Stasiuk. Now, it could be Russian or Polish. Doctor, I've got to come back here again with a tape recorder. You'd better hurry. She's getting weaker. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, Well, there's 
does all that give me? It's Russian, Artie. Russian? Uh, what does that mean? Look, there's an Orthodox church around the corner. It turns out to be her church. The priest says the tape is hard to understand that he can make out some of it. Well, what's she saying? She's trying to describe a killer. That word, Uvita, or something like that, that means assassin, murderer. And he could be an albino. What? She uses the word for pink. A word like Hrosabi in connection with eyes and hair. And there's one key word. Kalbin, I think. It could either be the killer's name. Well, uh, are any local punks named Kalvin? Or, more likely, it's the Russian word Kalbin or Kalbin, which means albino or the guy with real light colored hair and eyes. White. That's right. Whitey Barrows. It can't be. Why not? Because, as far as we know, Whitey's a hitman for some of the biggest mobs. He gets 20, 30 grand a contract. This holdup could have been a contract. Oh, a little grocery storekeeper, your ex-girlfriend, this elderly Russian lady, to whom are they worth 20, 30 grand? Look, if it wasn't a contract, what was Whitey doing in on it? You know the terrible thing here? This Whitey, this million-dollar killer, he can just be walking along the street. He needs some loose change. Maybe he's left his money home. So he walks into the first store he sees. And what's he going to get? A hundred bucks? Look at how easy he is to describe he knows he'll have to kill every living soul in the place. All that for a hundred bucks? Yeah, Bobby. He would do all that for just a hundred bucks. That's what we're dealing with. Yeah, we better pick him up. Eleanor was in trouble. That's why she called me. But you don't know that. Whitey was paid to kill her and to make it look as if she is the accidental victim of an ordinary stick-up. He works it that way. And just kills two other people. Okay, so now you tell me why she was marked and by who. I don't know. Look, maybe she was running around with Whitey and yeah, she might have done something he didn't like. Yes, like what? Uh, I don't know like what. Maybe like phoning you, for instance. Yes? Dora Hastings? Yes. I'm a police detective. May I come in? Oh, of course, please do. Thank you. It's about Eleanor, isn't it? I've already talked to some other officers. You were her roommate? Yes, I... I still can't believe it. I mean, here was a girl with everything to live for. The breaks were really starting to come her way. What breaks? You name it, all of them. She finally broken into the design field. She got that great consulting job with Wainwright. Yes? And she was getting married. Yeah, she grew up at last. She figured it was time to put out the torch. The torch? Well, some fellow she'd gone to school with years ago. They had an argument over something or other, and that was it. For years, maybe she thought he might call her, but he didn't. Can you believe a thing like that? Yes. So she settled for the boss's nephew at Wainwright. Can you imagine settle for Lester Crane? Settle for a guy who has either 30 or 40 million dollars? But that's how she put it. She was one of a kind, that girl. Tell me, uh, recently, did she seem upset about anything? Well, yes, I would say so. Can you tell me what it was? I don't know. I asked her and she said it was just nerves. What reason would there be for nerves, did she put it? Well, that's what I could never understand. She was sitting on top of the world, yet she... She was terrified. Terrified? That's a pretty strong word. It is. She was terrified. But weren't you concerned? I was. But if she made up her mind not to tell you anything, you couldn't shake her. Yes, I know. You know? How would you know that? Oh, I, uh... I know girls like that. Now, you have no idea what could have caused her to be so frightened. No. Besides, does it matter anymore? She's dead. Try to remember everything you can about her being frightened. Just how bad was it? You want to know? Last week, she got up in the middle of the night. She couldn't sleep. She was irritated. Irritated by what? Her body was irritated. What? You know, you can get skin rashes from nervousness and tension. She called for a cab and went right to the hospital. And then? She came back the next morning. She was better. Well, anyhow, she seemed different. In what way? Quiet. She was quiet. Calm. Actually, she would keep muttering the same thing. What same thing? I have no idea. It sounded like EL-77. 
E L L I can't figure it out. She just keeps saying it the way people do when something bothers. Well, didn't you ask her what it meant? Well, yes. I mean, she told me right off to forget it. E L seventy seven. Well, I don't even know if that's right. It just sounded something like that. Well, yesterday she said, there's only one man in the world who can help me. She was going to call this fellow and ask him to come see her. Did she say who? No, I was in the other room when she called him. And I guess he must have turned her down because she said later, it doesn't matter now. And then... Oh, and then this morning... Well, I hope I was able to help you. Help me? Yes. What I told you. Did it help you? No, Jason. I'm afraid it doesn't help me at all. How can it help when you know that if you had accepted an old friend's invitation to breakfast, she might still be alive? How does it help to know when it's too late that both your lives might have been different? Was that pickup merely a covering device for her deliberate murder? I'll return shortly with Act Two. The world should turn on love and understanding. Instead, it seems to be spun by vanity and pride. So many people could prevent so many problems. Indeed, could alter the very shape and direction of their lives if they could only talk freely and openly and honestly at the right time. Ten years ago, obviously, Eleanor Brody and Bob Clifton couldn't do it. And today, she has been killed during what appeared to be a grocery store robbery. And he is the detective investigating the case. Sit down, Sergeant. I'm sorry to disturb you at a time like this, Mr. Crane. I... Understand. You were Miss Brody's fiance? Yes, I was. Tell me, uh, did she seem to be upset recently? Upset? Why did she be upset? Oh, uh, Sergeant, this is my uncle, James Wainwright. I was told there was a police officer in the house. What can we do for you? I want to ask a few questions. No? Why? Uncle Jim, uh, it should be obvious why. It isn't obvious to me, and besides, they didn't ask you. After all, what did you to ask? She was killed in a holdup, wasn't she? Well, officer, wasn't she? I tried. Unfortunate coincidence. Past life had nothing to do with it. She would have been killed in any event. Therefore, the police have no reason to pry into the affairs of private citizens. Would you agree, sir? Well, perhaps if it were just a holdup. What do you What do you mean, sir? What else could it have been? A way of covering up for murder. Yes. Serious? Oh, yes, I am. And that's why I'm here, to ask some questions. Well, how could we possibly help you? I don't know. Well, if this is a fishing expedition, you've come to the wrong stream. I will answer no questions unless my attorney is present. Uncle Jim, the man is just trying to do his That's job. That's enough out of you two, Lester. Mr. Wainwright, I'm investigating a murder. I need information on the background of Miss Brody. It's immaterial to me whether I get my answers here or down at headquarters. I don't like your attitude. Well, how do you know the commissioner is an intimate friend of mine? Uncle, let's get this over with. Well, what do you want to know? Miss Brody, did she seem upset lately? Well, no. Not at all. Why do you ask? Her roommate says she was. Oh. Well, that happens. Oh. You know women, they get nervous as their wedding day approaches. I don't mean that kind of nervous. I mean terrified. Well, yeah, she might have been terrified. Of what? Of her uh, approaching responsibility. She was marrying very far above her station in life. Now, Uncle Jim, you shouldn't talk like that. Why not? True. She was a poor girl, and my company, which one day will be this young man... Has assets of $50 million. What is your company, sir? Wainwright Associates. What does Wainwright Associates do? <laughs> you can't be serious. I'm sorry. We import textiles. All kinds of textiles from all over the world. Yes? And we sell them to various manufacturers. I see. And Miss Brody's position? She was a designer. We maintain a design service for many of our clients. Well, uh, that uh, should end the imposition. Tell me... Would either of you be aware of a man with a very light complexion, almost no coloring at all? Uh, why do you why do you ask? It's important to our investigation. No, no, I'm aware of no such person. Mr. Crane? No. I have a question. Yes? My nephew here, Lester Crane. 
who gave Miss Doty a great many gifts. Are they, uh, are they recovering? Uncle Jim, how can we talk about that now? These things have to be faithless, sir. Well, Jackson, what procedure do we follow? It seemed to me that your attorney could advise you. Those gifts were her property. They belonged to her estate. Well, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of things that belong to Wainwright and companies and designs and clothes, especially a uh, sweater that's a new model. You'd have to discuss that down at headquarters. Well, sir, uh, if you have no further questions... I have no further questions at this time. <laughs> Yeah, Captain Gordon. Yes, there may be a break on those murders. But so far, we got nothing to give out. Look, Charlie, things are rough all over. Yeah, Bobby, what have you got? Sore feet, Captain. Well, you did want to investigate some murders. Where are we? The roommate says she was scared, too. Yeah, we had that yesterday. And old Wainwright says she was just normally nervous about getting married. And... Nobody cares what young Lester says because he doesn't count. Is that how it still adds up so far? Now, how about Whitey? Whitey is safe and snug and warm in a rat hole somewhere. We well, can't hide forever. I'll get him if it takes the rest of my life. That's no way for a smart cop to work. There can't be anything personal in it. This whole thing is personal. If I'd had breakfast with her, she'd still be alive. But what does that do to your theory? If she was marked, they would have gotten her another kind. Yeah, homicide, Captain Gordon. Oh, Captain, this is Justin Barrow. And there's a detective with you who's investigating that gruff and still hold up. Uh, yeah, Sergeant Clifton. Uh, hold on, Doctor. Bobby, it's uh, Dr. Sparrow at General Hospital. Sergeant Clifton. Oh, Sergeant, I know you people are very busy. This is probably nothing. Well, let me judge that, Doctor. Well, I mean, I'll just say that I, I wouldn't even think that there's any evidence. Well, you must have some reason for calling me. Well, do you remember, Sergeant? When you were in the hospital and we were listening to the poor old Russian lady, she felt better about her. Sorry to hear that. Well, I remember we were saying how things were interrelated. Yes. And that Miss Brody had been in here a week before she died or was killed because of a severe skin irritation. Yes, I remember. Well, she has a roommate, uh, Miss Nora Hastings. Miss Hastings is here now with the same skin irritation. But doesn't I mean, from a police point of view, or am I wasting your time? I'll be right there. Actually, she came in last night. She's much better now. We figured it. She can go home tomorrow. What caused it, Doctor? Well, it's a sweater. A sweater? Probably the most beautiful sweater I've ever seen. Such brilliant color, lovely design, but... But what? But there must be something in the dye. It seems to have a very strong alkali base. It can give a lot of trouble, especially to people with sensitive skin. Hello, Miss Hastings. Oh, am I in trouble with the law? Why should you be in trouble with the law? Uh, for taking the sweater. I don't know anything about that. I've been punished enough. Take it back. Put it with all her things. I don't want it. Why don't you tell me about it? I knew something would happen to me. What? I never saw anything in my life. So the first time I weakened. So what did I take? I didn't try to steal any of her jewelry or anything that was really valuable. I just took the sweater. The sweater? Well, who'd miss it or know anything about it? I couldn't resist it. It's so pretty. So look at what happened. My arms. Certain people, and I'm one of them, should never steal. Please, take it back to the apartment. All right, now you decided to take the sweater. Well, I wore it when I went shopping and out to dinner. And then a couple of hours later, I felt as if my whole body were on fire. Say, that's what must have happened to Ellen the night she had to come here. She'd worn the sweater, too. Are you sure? I'm positive. And where did she get the sweater? She brought it home from the office. It's one she designed. You mind if I take it? Please. Oh. Hey, Bobby. There was a phone call for you. From whom? Well, it was about you. It seems that Wainwright had a court order to go to the Brody girl's place and pick up some designs that belong to the firm. So? Yeah, so they claim something's missing. What? The sweater. What kind of sweater? Come on, you know what kind of sweater. The sweater you were supposed to bring back from the hospital. The one that the roommate borrowed. That sweater? Where is it? 
In my locker? What kind of game are you playing, Bobby? They want it back. I'll bring it back, Bobby. You're trying to pull a fast one, but this Wainwright has got a lot of clout. Why did they want the sweater? Because it's their property. Sure, but when I was at the house, the old man started the song and dance about recovering some gifts and stuff. It was all a cover. For what? For the sweater. Why would they want that sweater? Huh? From what I hear, it's already given two girls fit. There is a hard luck sweater. Yeah, still they want it and it belongs to them. So, so I'll bring it back. Yeah. Bobby, do I know everything that's going on? No. You only know as much as I do. You personally hand deliver that sweater? Of course. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Lester Crane. Police. Oh, wow. You don't look like a cop. No, why not? You're cute. Uh, did you know Eleanor Brody, Miss, uh... Carter. Melba Carter. Miss Carter? Oh, sure. We, we both come here about the same week nine years ago. We both sat at the same desk. She went out all the way up. She even got the boss's nephew. Tell me, did she seem nervous lately? Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry to say I was so jealous of her, I couldn't really see straight. <sighs> Kid, what good did it do her? Did some man ever come around to see her, a man with a very light complexion? A guy? He? Oh, no. Why would you want to ruin the world's greatest setup? There was a guy on the side. He was kept out of sight. Would you tell Mr. Crane that I'm here, please? Don't you want to ask me any more questions? Maybe later. Thank you, Sergeant. It's a beautiful sweater. I've never seen such brilliant colors and the design. Yes, sir. Uh, well, it's... Uh, I'm sorry there uh, was this misunderstanding. I had intended to return it on my way to work. It's all right. Look, I, I want to apologize for my uncle. Uh, he, well, lives in a world of his own. I understand. He belongs to another time, another place. Mm -hmm. You were uh, Eleanor's fiance. What did you say? I'm sorry. I was just thinking out loud. Yes, I, I was her fiance, and, uh, well, I... I owed her so much. You see, because of her, I I stood up to my uncle. He he was opposed to our getting married. Why? Why? He wouldn't need a reason. He's so contrary. And well, I I always yielded to his judgment, but not this time. Yes. Miss Crane, there's been an inquiry concerning El seventy seven. El seventy seven. You told me that... EL-77? You told me you'd handle everything there yourself, so I... Uh, uh, I'll place that call on hold, and I'll pick it up very soon. Uh, Sergeant, uh, is there anything else you uh, want to know? I, I have some very important things. No, no, I've taken up enough of your time. Goodbye, Mr. Crane. EL-77. Once again, a combination of letters and numbers. And what do they mean? One thing is certain. They have the power to make people nervous. First, Eleanor Brody. And now, Lester Crane. EL-77. A simple arrangement of innocent-looking letters and numbers. Well, any arrangement of letters and numbers can look innocent. Consider E equals MC squared. I'll be back, hopefully in just a few moments for that, too. the poet said, the saddest words of tongue and pen are these, it might have been. Bob Clifton thinks of what might have been with Eleanor Brody. Ten years ago, they were too proud, too immature perhaps, to know how to make love endure. Now the only thing that Bob can do for Eleanor is try to bring her killer to justice. No, Bob! Why not? Because you can get into more trouble than you ever thought existed. Is that all you ever think about getting into trouble? This side, it's wrong. Why? Why is it wrong? Because, Bobby, you propose to use a human decoy. A girl can be killed. How? If we have it staked out, all we want him to do is show himself. Then we bag him. On what charge? He's been identified as the killer in the grocery store holdup. How? And by whom? The old lady died last night. 
God, are the delirious mumblings on a tape recorder. Come on. A smart lawyer could kill it. He's got to do more than just show himself. He has to come after her. We have to prove it is a murder. What do you want? The smoking pistol? By then it's too late. Not the smoking pistol, but the pistol. He has to be caught in the act of trying to gun her down. And that's cutting it too close. Not if we have him covered. It's too risky. Too much can go wrong. It's the only way. Bobby, I don't want to hear any more about it. You don't have to do it, Miss Hastings. But I want to. This could be very dangerous. I don't care. It's the least I can do for Eleanor. I shouldn't ask you to do it either. It's just that I have to get that killer. I understand. Let me make a confession, Miss Hastings. You don't have to. I'm the man Eleanor spoke to last Friday. I knew that. You knew? How? Oh, woman's intuition, maybe. But you had to be the man. Do you want me to make that call now? Yes. And say exactly what I told you. Hello? Mr. Wainwright? Yes? Mr. Wainwright, I've been talking. Who, who are you? I have certain information. What is this? Concerning EL-77. What? what? What did you think? You heard what I said. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. Make me an offer. Offer? To do what? Well, not to go to the police, for instance. Oh. Oh, I see. Is that how it is? Yes, that's how it is. Well, uh, let me, uh, let me think about it. You don't have any time. I'm leaving the country tonight. I'd like to travel first class, you know what I mean. See you in an hour. Could you make that... Two hours. But no longer. And uh, the address? 18 Stevens Court. Sounds familiar. It should. I'm her roommate. <laughs> Anyone moving up the street? Not yet. Are you sure this is the only entrance to the building? Yes, you couldn't get in any other way. All right. You have to come up the street. Walk in the front door. Come up the stairs, knock on your door. Now, don't stand near the doorway. He might shoot through it. Leave the door unlocked. When he knocks, you say, come in, it's open. When he walks in, I'll be ready for him. And keep out of sight. Look, down the street, is that someone coming? Stand by the side of the window. If that's our boy, don't let him see you. I know Mr. Wainwright. It isn't him. No, it wouldn't be Mr. Wainwright. It would be an employee of his. He's too well in this dark, but I'm sure that it's... It's who? The man who killed Eleanor. Oh, so quiet. You can almost hear his footsteps. Wait. There are men getting out of those cars. Look. Hold it, lady. Freeze. Hardy. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I had the place faked out. Why? To save your neck. I knew you'd try to get Whitey to show himself. I wasn't going to let him come up to the apartment. But you killed him. How can we tie him to Wainwright? Bobby, it was the only thing we could do. Well, hello. Oh, oh you're the cop who called on Mr. Crane, the cute one. Is everything squared away? Yes, I guess so. I, I was headed for your office. Oh, so am I. Look, maybe you could do something for me. Well, why not? Uh, this is a package of some papers that we found in Miss Brody's apartment. Now, some of them look like business things, and we want to return them to the company. Could you save me the trip? Okay. It's a nice day for walks, though, isn't it? I don't even know if they're important, but I figured perhaps... Uh, what's the average cop do on his day off? Uh, some of them are just notes. And there's a number that I noticed. It says EL-77. What does EL-77 mean? Oh, 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 it's a lot number. A lot? Yeah, it would mean a European lot EL, and the number 77 means 7.7 .7 million yards. That's quite a number of yards. Yeah, pretty good size, even for us. It's uh, a hush-hush thing. What do you mean? I don't know. The only people who know anything about it are Lester Crane and the old man. Well, where is it? Where? The warehouse, I guess. 
Do you work every day in the week? But thank you very much, and uh, this is a favor. Bye. Hey, 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 come back here. You forgot... He wants me to deliver a package, and he forgets to give me the package. Some cop. <laughs> Here's some. I'm sorry to bother you again, Doctor. Oh, it's all right. That sweater, the one Miss Hastings wore... And we know now that Miss Brody wore it, too. You said something about the dye. Yes, I sent a few strands to the lab. We have a very extensive allergy clinic here. It's a very good wool. But I'm afraid it's ruined for any kind of wear. Why? The dye. The strange one, probably foreign. It isn't any of the known dyes used here. It's a very strong alkali content. If a manufacturer knew the dye had such a strong irritant quality, why would he use it? Maybe he didn't know, or... Maybe he thought he could get away with it. Doctor, suppose you knew where a whole lot of this material was. What would happen to it? Oh, I'm sure it could be condemned. Any federal, state, or city health department or bureau of standards would take it right off the market. Thank you, Doctor. Do you think this sweater has to do with those murders? I don't mind telling you, Sergeant, I'm not in the habit of receiving the police at this hour of the night. I'm here on official business, Mr. Wayne. Indeed. Right? Well, then why not conduct it during business hours? I have here a few strands of a wool material. Where did you get that? From a certain sweater. Oh. Well, oh, what's that to me? This sweater was a sample. It was to be duplicated and sent out to Wainwright customers to show the brilliant colors that were a part of a certain imported lot. How dare you pry into the business of my company? European lot 77. The dye in it makes the material unfit for human clothing. That is a lie. Is it? If inspectors were to examine lot number 77 in your warehouse, Mr. Wainwright, what would happen? Excuse me, I, uh, I have a document here in my desk which will explain everything. Let's see now. Yes, here it is. All right, put up your hand. No, don't reach for your gun. You can't get away with it. Well, me. I'll just have to. Uncle Jim, what are you doing? Uh, Fletcher, he has a gun in his belt holster. Reach around. Get it. I warn you, Sergeant. Don't try anything. But, but just do can't... as I tell you. Want to go bankrupt and in jail? Just, just remove it. Now hold on to that gun. Oh, what, what are you going to do with him? Kill him. Oh, no. You... I just explained the alternative. That's right, Lester. He has to kill me just as he killed Eleanor. What? Well, what are you talking about? Oh, he didn't kill her. He hired a son to do it. No, she was killed in a, a, a holdup. In what looked like a holdup. You see, she knew about EL-77, too, and she wanted... That's enough. She wanted you to destroy it. I, I know, I know, but... But how often we do that, huh? We... We would have lost millions. She said she'd go to the police, didn't she? No, no, she only said she'd break the engagement. But your uncle could have... Lester, her. Lester, we're wasting time. You can't keep killing people, Mr. Wainwright. Uncle Jim, there can't be any killing. There's already been killing. Your uncle had Eleanor murdered. Don't listen to him. Sergeant, we... Look, look. We have to get rid of that cloth. It's wrong, I know, but if we don't, we'll go broke. Eleanor couldn't understand that. So she, she walked out on me. But she would have come back afterward, except that she was killed in that store. No. Wainwright killed her. He knew she'd turn you in. Don't you see what he's trying to do? What? Why do we have to kill him? What else is there? Why can't we have an understanding? Sergeant, there's a way out of this. There must be. No. The only way is for me to take Mr. Wainwright and book him for the murder of Eleanor Brody. And you're going to let him do that? I can. Go ahead, Lester. Ask him. Ask him if he killed her. Uncle, did you... What else could be done, you fool? We'd have all gone to the jailhouse first and the poorhouse second. Did you kill her? Yes. Yes, I killed her. I hired a man to kill her. I had to. You weren't mad enough to kill her yourself. You killed her! Lester. My uncle? I'm afraid he's dead. I hope... I hope... I die, too. I'll call an ambulance. Please, please. I have to tell you this first. I... I just shot him. So... To prove something... To you. To me? Why? Because... She told me everything about her past. She'd always be in love with a man. Her name... 
Bobby Clifton. <laughs> that's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's me. I killed him because she... She finally made a man out of me. She taught me how to stand up to him. And I did. I did. Didn't I, Bobby? Yeah. Yeah, but, uh... The old man is dead. The nephew recovered. Lot EL-77 was destroyed. It would be nice to report that Bobby married Dora Hastings and Lester married Melba, but we're not in business to tie up neat little packages. All we have done is open up the book of someone's life, glanced at a page, and returned it to the shelf as I shall be returned to you in just a few moments. It is written, Every man is a weaver, and on his loom he weaves his life. But the colors and the design are not created by the skill of his hands. Rather, do they spring forth from the beauty of his heart. We are also weavers, weavers of spells, and we hope you will join us seven times each week and enjoy our designs. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Bob Caliban, Joe Silver, Bryna Rayburn, and Catherine Byers. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next they're hiding in a cave. A cave? You must do better than that, my dear. You, uh, you pick up the pathway just past our house. And you follow it north for two miles. Now you come to a deep ravine. In front of you is, is what looks like a wall of solid rock. But it isn't. No. Because... When you climb to the top of it, you will see the entrance to the cave. Thank you. Sergeant, place her under arrest. But, but you said... I you... said you'd be rewarded. At this point, I don't know how. If you're lying, a firing squad will give you 30 leaden oh. bullets. If you're truthful, there. There are 30 silver kroner. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery theater comes to you from CBS Radio and Radio 87 WWL here in New Orleans. Our studio is located in the historic old French Quarter, way down yonder in New Orleans. Eight minutes after eight o'clock.